As we continue our worship by meditating on the Word of God, I would invite you to turn in your Bible to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Our text for today is John chapter 5, verses 24 to 26. If you are visiting with us, we are in the middle of a mini-sermon Jesus gave to the Jewish leaders in defense of His right to heal on the Sabbath. But more importantly, He gave this sermon to reveal His divine unity with the Father. Two weeks ago, we looked at the introduction and the main idea of this sermon in verses 16 to 23. And last week, we began his first main point in verse 24, considering the wonder of eternal life that Jesus gives. If you weren't there, I'd encourage you to listen to that. It'll be a helpful expansion on what we say today. But today, we're going to focus on verses 24 to 26 to round out our study on Jesus' first main point about his work of eternal life. So to get the whole context in our minds, Let's read once again verses 19 to verse 30. The Word of God says, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing. And greater works than these will He show Him, so that you may marvel. For as the Son raises, rather, as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, So he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing of my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. Last week I aimed to show you that real Christianity is not fundamentally found in right living, or right doctrine, or even the right gospel, as vital as all of those are. Living an upright moral life is an outflow of real Christianity. Believing true doctrine keeps one within the realm of real Christianity. And of course, the gospel is the foundational truth we must believe to enter into real Christianity. But it's possible to have any or all of those elements masking a false faith. So let me add another mistaken view of real Christianity from our friend Henry Skugel from his book, The Life of God in the Soul of Man. After describing those who put all of their faith in their right living or put all of their faith in their right doctrine, he mentions another group. He says there are those, or rather there are others, who put all of their Christianity in their feelings in emotional experiences, and in their ecstasy in devotion. All they pursue is to pray passionately, to think of heaven with pleasure, and to experience warm feelings when they see their Savior's affections. Based on these things, they convince themselves that they are deeply in love with Him, 
They assume that they are truly saved because of their experiences. They consider this feeling-based confidence to be the greatest of Christian blessings. And then summarizing all of what he has said of those different groups, all of these ideas about Christianity are not accurate representations of the straight and narrow path that leads to life. At best, they are only ways to obtain the real thing or simply practices of it. These things are frequently mistaken to be the whole of Christianity. Unquote. If you're trying to get at the essence of what real Christianity is, it is none of the above. The essence, as we saw last week, of real Christianity is that it, it separates, rather the real essence that separates it from all false religion and all counterfeit versions of Christianity is that it is the life of God in the soul of man. Put simply, those who are real Christians have eternal life. And those who are not real Christians do not have eternal life. As we've seen, eternal life is not the promise of a future life that takes place and begins after this life. No, it is a new life that begins here and now. Apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, I cannot think of a more important truth for us to understand because our very lives depend on it. To misunderstand real Christianity is to go through your whole life thinking you're a Christian only to find yourself standing before the judge and hear that you never really were a Christian at all. Jesus warns of this possibility not simply as a hypothetical possibility, but as what many Christians will experience. He says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Beloved, if you do not want to hear those words from Jesus, I would implore you to listen to what Jesus says in our text. Today we're going to marvel at Jesus, the giver of life, in verses 24 to 26, under the three headings, the gift of life, the cause of life, and the source of life. The gift of life, the cause of life, and the source of life. Let's look at verse 24 again and consider the gift of life. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Jesus gives the gift of life to those who are dead and headed for judgment. The Bible teaches that that all people are born into this world spiritually dead. This is to say that we are cut off from understanding God's truth. We are separated from the life of God. We are oblivious to the knowledge of God. We are unable to change our our behavior because our soul is hostile to God. But this is not the way the world began. When God made Adam, Genesis 2 says, he formed him out of the dust of the of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life. And it says that Adam became a living soul. And as a living soul made by God, his mind and his affections and his will were united to God such that he could know and understand God. He desired what is good and beautiful and his will. He was committed to doing God's will. The Lord gave Adam and Eve a variety of instructions of how they were to live and his provision that he had provided for them. And and he gave them only one negative command. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. 
Well, we know what happened. They ate the fruit. But did they die? Many would say, no, they didn't die. After all, Genesis 5 tells us they lived for hundreds of years longer. And so, therefore, what God must have meant is that the day that they ate of the fruit, they would begin the process of dying. They would begin to age, and, 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 and all that would take place in the death process would start to happen that day that they ate the fruit. However true that might be, in another sense, they truly and fully died that day. They died to God. When Eve ate the fruit, what happened is she listened to the serpent and she decided in her heart that God didn't want them to become like him. Therefore, he was holding out on them knowledge that would make them wise. Her act of eating then was tantamount to deicide, a word that Spurgeon was fond of using, which is the murder of God. Now, obviously, Eve could not actually murder God. But what she did was she made a choice that expressed her desire to be free from the rule of God in her life. And then Adam made the same choice. And so immediately what they thought would make them wise caused them to become fools. What they thought would make them free from God's rule enslaved them to sin. What they thought would make them know good and evil caused them to be darkened in their understanding. What they thought would make them like God made them realize how very much unlike God they are. Though they used to enjoy a close relationship with God, their sin created a separation. They were cast out of the garden. Genesis 4 and 5 are in the Bible to teach us One main truth, namely that when God said, on the day you eat of it, you shall surely die, he was right. And it wasn't just them, it was the whole human race which came into this condition of death. The death of the soul was so pervasive that it tells us in Genesis 6 verse 5, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that might sound harsh, but don't take that to mean that everybody was as wicked as they could possibly be. Not at all. In fact, Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 that on, in the day of Noah, people were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage, which means they were having a whole lot of parties that the intent, that every intent of the thoughts of their heart were only evil continually means that they had no fear of God, they had no knowledge of God, and they wanted nothing to do with God. And their lives reflected their anti-God views. In other words, they, they lived like people live today. Again, as we saw last week, spiritual death is defined in Ephesians 4.18 as being darkened in your understanding, being alienated from the life of God, being ignorant of God, and having a hard heart. Verse 19 goes on to describe what that kind of a, a death life leads to. Paul writes, They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. In yet another passage in his letter to Titus, Paul describes what characterizes those who are spiritually dead this way. He says, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. You can really fit the whole world's activities into those descriptions. Now, not every activity is inherently sinful, but the way that people engage in politics, sports, entertainment, education, hobbies, business, social media, can easily be described by the words foolish, disobedient, led astray, enslaved to various passions and pleasures, passing days in malice and envy, hating others and being hated by others. Now, in God's kindness, 
It is true that the sun rises on the evil and on the good. The, the rain falls on the just and the unjust so that we can all enjoy the innumerable blessings such as marriage and children and productivity and work, beauty and pleasure. But at the same time, the heart of the spiritually dead person is incapable of escaping from the kingdom of darkness. And again, it's even worse than that. They're not like those in prison camps, standing at the edge of the fence, longing for freedom. No, Colossians 1.21 says that those who are alienated from God are hostile to Him. And this is not that hard to prove in the world today. The name of God and the name of Jesus Christ are used as expletives constantly in the world around us. And while it's true that most people don't walk around with hostile thoughts toward God on the very forefront of their minds, all you have to do is bring up God and His standard of righteousness in any conversation and the hostility that lies just below the surface will appear. And this is why judgment is coming to all people. Humanity is not innocent before God. Mankind's offense is not ignoring God or being apathetic to God. No, every person is guilty of anti-God thoughts and anti-God motivations and anti-God words and anti-God actions. There is no greater proof than this or for this than the murder of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. Calvary, what is it? What but the climax of human iniquity, where man became not so much a regicide, though he slew his king, but a deicide. For to the utmost of his power, he slew his God. On the cross, human enmity of God reached its most dread extremity. With wicked hands, men crucified and slew the Son of God. Unquote. And yet, it is that very extreme act that put on display the spiritual death of mankind that also put on display the extremity of God's love. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And He died by taking our sin upon Himself, thereby satisfying the wrath of God that was due to us. And because, Jesus is, uh, because of Jesus' death, we read in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our sin once stood as a wall between us and God. Isaiah 59 says, your iniquities have created a separation between you and God. And your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. Our sin was like a chasm between us and God that we could never bridge. But on the cross, Jesus, He broke down that wall of hostility. He created a bridge across that chasm. He removed every barrier that once stood against us, between us and God. If you will, He removed the stone that was keeping us in the, uh, locked in the tomb of darkness. Now, how did you do that? By forgiving us. In the words of Colossians 2.14, He canceled the record of debt that stood against us. At the cross, He took our sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west. But we need more than forgiveness. We need more than just having that barrier removed. When, when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, he did not simply say, take the stone away. Removing the barrier was necessary, but it was not enough. No, he had to say, Lazarus, come forth. And so it is with us. Yes, he forgives us of all of our sin, but more than that, he gives us life. And verse 24 tells us specifically that he gives us eternal life. 
He gives us a new heart that beats for God. He gives us the knowledge of God. He reconciles us to the knowledge of God and empowers us to live for God. He removes that oppressive darkness that kept our minds from understanding the truth of God. And the result is that our lives look radically different from what it once was when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It's not just that we have the forgiveness of God. Our entire life is radically transformed. Now last week we went into detail of each of those aspects of eternal life that Jesus gives to those who believe on him. Rather than reviewing those again in detail, I want to I want to address a struggle that maybe some of you are having in light of these truths. I want to lay out four, I guess, categories, you could say, of possible struggles that even hearing the wonder of eternal life might create struggles in your heart. So I'll lay out the the categories of struggle and then we'll consider how to think about them. First, when you think about eternal life, meaning that you have a new heart, that you have a heart that is now able to think rightly and desire good things and submit to God's will, perhaps you struggle with the fact that sometimes you feel like your heart is still callous to the things of God. Perhaps you struggle in in knowing that you often believe that which is not true over and against that which is true. Or you still feel attraction to those things that are displeasing to God. Or you struggle to submit to God's will for your life because it's not what you want for your life. Perhaps you're thinking, I I hear what you're saying, that eternal life means that I have a new heart that beats for God, but sometimes, if not often, it sure feels like my heart still beats for sin. And I have far less interest in the things of God than I think I should. That's one category of struggle. Maybe a second struggle someone might have is wondering if they really know God in a personal way. If eternal life is, as Jesus said, knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ, His Son, and by that meaning that you have a relationship with them, then how do you know if you have such a relationship? After all, God doesn't text us. Jesus doesn't come and hang out with us. Maybe you would say, I pray all the time, but it just feels like God's not listening to my prayers. Maybe I don't have eternal life. A third struggle someone might have is you think your sin is still standing between you and God. Perhaps you feel powerless to live up to God's standards. You you know what God's standards are and you know that they're good, but you keep falling short. And and other times you flat out live for your flesh because you've just given up trying because you've failed so many times. And maybe someone might struggle finally because the truth seems so hard to understand. You read your Bible and it just doesn't make sense. You have questions and the more you read, it only creates more questions rather than giving you answers. You hear and read what people say about theology and it's just more confusing because of how many different opinions there are. Some of you might have one of those struggles. Some of you might have all of those struggles. Do any or all of those things mean you don't have eternal life? Well, let me walk through a series of truths to help you examine your own heart and consider whether or not you have eternal life. First, remember that salvation is a free gift of God, which we receive by faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of sin and eternal life are not earned by cleaning up our lives and making ourselves acceptable to God. We are not and we cannot be acceptable to God on our own efforts. We are like birds trapped in in an oil spill. Anything we do to to get uh, free of ourselves only causes it to get worse. We need God to pick us up out of that oil and cleanse us with the blood of Christ, which makes us white as snow. So the only way to receive forgiveness and eternal life is by believing in the sinless life and the substitutionary death and the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the only means by which you can be justified before a holy God. 
Repentance, which is required for salvation, means a change of mind. And so to be saved, you must have your mind changed and agree with God about your sin and your need for forgiveness. You must change your mind and believe in Jesus Christ as your only hope. And so if you get discouraged because you look at your life and you wonder if you're saved, remember that believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only way to have eternal life. Second, remember that just as a newborn has life, but requires a lifetime to live and think and learn how to navigate this world, So it is in the kingdom of God. When you are born again, you don't have all of the knowledge of God. Your relationship with God will be shallow. Your understanding of his will will be next to nothing. Your understanding of what a God glorifying God, uh, God glorifying life looks like will be minimal. Your spiritual muscles and impulses will be weak. And you still have the muscle memory And the habits of your former life that require a whole lot of practice to overcome. 1 Peter 2.2 says, Like newborn infants long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow up into salvation. That doesn't mean you grow up to become saved. That means you grow up to fill the shoes of salvation that you already have. This is why Christ created the church. It's the place where we gather to help one another grow in Christ. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So when you get discouraged at your lack of progress in life, or you feel stuck, remember that the Christian life is a lifelong journey, which often includes plateaus and crevices that we fall into. But with the Word of God, with the Spirit of God dwelling within you, with the people of God around you, you can grow. When you're questioning whether you have eternal life, remember that believing in Jesus Christ is your only hope for eternal life. And remember that being born again is a journey where there are many pitfalls and many challenges. Third, remember that the Christian life is a fierce spiritual battle. It's a fierce spiritual battle. The world, the flesh, and the devil are dead set against everyone who would seek to follow Christ. The world around you bombards you with messages, enticing you with experiences, pretending like they have what will make you happy. Your own flesh, which is still tainted by sin and its corruption, produces ungodly desires and cravings that we must resist. And the devil and his angels have the singular mission of trying to do everything in their power to destroy the work of God in your life. Paul said to Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And there he's clearly speaking of those Uh, people outside, unbelievers who are persecuting believers. But there's still a sense in which we are persecuted by our own flesh and by the devil himself and his demons. Every effort at growing in godliness and growing in the knowledge of the truth and overcoming sin is met with resistance by our flesh that only wants to do what's easy and serve itself. And we're always met with resistance by the spiritual forces that want us to believe what is false. And question our salvation and doubt the truth. And then the world pressures us by mocking us about what is good and right and true. This is why we're called in Ephesians 6 to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. And to put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the evil schemes of the devil. This is why we're called in Romans chapter 12 verse 2 to not be conformed to the world but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And this is why we're called in 1 Peter 2.11 to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. All this to say that there is 
there is in every true believer a deep battle in the soul between godly and ungodly thinking, godly and ungodly desires, godly and ungodly habits of life. And that deep battle is not a sign that there is no spiritual life. In fact, it is a sign that there is spiritual life. Beloved, when you get sick, we've all gotten sick. Maybe even deathly sick. Have you ever had the thought, oh, I feel so awful. Am I even alive? Of course not. The fact that you're sick means that you're alive. The time for concern is if there's no battle. If you have no interest in truth, no desire to know God and live for Him, no will to pursue godly living, that is a clear indication that no matter what you say with your mouth, there's no spiritual life in you. Well, what do you do if that's the case? Repent. Believe in Christ. Plead with Him for mercy and forgiveness and that He would give you eternal life. Oh, dear saint, do you not know that those who are enslaved to drugs and alcohol, to pornography, fornication, lying, stealing, anger, abuse, and all other sins, that they will not inherit the kingdom of God? And such were some of you. You in this room, who have been embattled in those sins. You have been washed. You have been justified. You have been cleansed by Christ. He has regenerated you. He's given you a new heart. He's reconciled to yourself, reconciled you to himself. He's enlightened your mind. You are forgiven and set free from what was once your life. It's no longer you who live. It's Christ who lives in you. And the life that you now live in the flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. Jesus came to give life to those who are dead. And yes, sometimes that life doesn't feel like life. But it is. If you just stop to realize that he has given you a mind to desire it. Him, to know Him, and to live for Him. Now, how does this happen? How does life come to those who are spiritually dead? Let's consider the cause of life in verses 25 and 26. The cause of life. Again, verse 24, uh, verses 24 and 25 rather. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word, and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. John began his gospel in chapter 1 by identifying Jesus as the Word. And as the Word, he was the one who spoke all things into existence. And just as when Jesus, who is the Word, spoke everything that came into existence, we see here that when He speaks to the dead, they live. Notice in verse 25 that Jesus begins again with, Truly, truly, I say to you. As we said last time in verse 24, that's to slow us down, to get us to really uh, raise our attention and focus on what He's saying. By saying it again here, He brings us to a full stop with laser focus to make sure we give His words our full attention. He says next, an hour is coming and is now here. So He's not speaking of the resurrection of the dead in the future. That'll be in verse 28. He's speaking of the resurrection that takes place today. Eternal life is now, right here. When the dead hear the voice of the Son of God, they are raised to life. Just as sure as Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come out, and he came out. So it is with everyone who hears the voice of Jesus to rise from the dead. The Lord of life creates life through the power of his word. In Ezekiel 16, the Lord describes the history of his relationship with Israel. 
And he describes the beginning of Israel as a nation, metaphorically, as if they were a discarded child in the field. And he says to them in verse 6, When I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live! I said to you in your blood, live! You know what happens when God says to you, live? You live! In Ezekiel 37, the Lord gave the prophet a, a vision to explain to him again how he will restore Israel one day. And he showed in this valley that was full of dry bones, not a lick of flesh on them. And the Lord says to him, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, Lord, you know. Then he said to him, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So Ezekiel speaks to the bones as the Lord commanded him. And you know what happens? They come to life. The word of the Lord is what produces life in dead souls. The New Testament teaches this as well. 1 Peter 1.23 says, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, uh, through the living and abiding word of God. The same is said in James chapter 1, verse 18, Of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth, that we would be a kind of firstfruits of His creatures. Now here in verse 24 and 25, we're told it's the hearing of His voice that produces life. Verse 24, whoever hears my word. Verse 25, the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. What does it mean to hear the voice of God? Is it possible to strain your ear? Maybe to incline your heart? Or maybe to still yourself so that you can hear His voice? Of course not. Just as there was nothing Lazarus could do as he lay dead in the tomb to hear the voice of Christ. And just like the dry bones in Ezekiel's vision didn't even have ears that they could use to listen, there is nothing a spiritually dead person can do to hear the voice of the Son of God. God must grant the ability to hear. And the granting of the ability to hear is the giving of eternal life. And it's here that we see the necessary truth of God's sovereignty in salvation. If all that the Bible says about spiritual death is true, there is nothing we can do to save ourselves. In our natural state, we are dead to God and we love it. We wouldn't even want to hear His voice. So the only way a spiritually dead person can hear the voice of the Son of God is if the Son of God grants life. Jesus says this explicitly to the Pharisees in chapter 8. He says, whoever is of God hears the voice of God. The reason why you do not hear is because you are not of God. To be of God is a shorthand way of saying to be born of God, to belong to God. And so we read again in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave them the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So in the, new, in the same way that a a newborn can't breathe air until it's been born and it has no role in its birth. So a person cannot hear the voice of the Son of God until they have been born again, given life by God. Or in the words of 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, when God shines the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ into our hearts, darkness flees and we can see with new eyes and hear with new ears. And like every newborn's first act in life is to take in a deep gulp of air and cry out. So the first act of new life in a person is to hear and believe the word of truth. New life is entirely and completely a work of God by grace motivated by love. 
We don't deserve it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. But 1 John 4, 9 says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that He sent His only Son into the world so that we might have life in Him. We need life because we all come into this world spiritually dead. And the cause of life is God granting us the enablement to hear and believe. Now, finally, consider the source of life. The source of life. Look at verse 26. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. The source of life is Jesus. Jesus is the giver of life. Now, how is it that Jesus, the Son of God, can give life? That's effectively the question Jesus is answering here. What gives Him the right or the authority or even the ability to give eternal life to dead souls? It's simply this. He has life in Himself. That is to say, He is self-existing. Jesus begins here by drawing another point of unity between the Father and the Son. He begins his statement saying, for as the Father has life in himself. To have life in himself again means that the Father is self-existent. He doesn't depend on anyone or anything outside of himself for life. God revealed this to Moses when he declared his name as I am who I am. Theologically, this is the doctrine of aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y, aseity. God is self-existent. No one gave him life. No one can take away his life. This is one of the essential attributes of deity. Only God can have self-existence, and one cannot be God without aseity. He alone is self-existing. So when Jesus says next, As the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. One could ask, how is self-existence something that can be granted? Because it cannot be that the Son was initially sustained by the Father, and then the Father later gave Him the ability to be self-sustaining. That would mean Jesus wasn't God, and then He became God. That's heresy. Well, theologians have answered this dilemma in light of the two natures of Christ, his divine nature and his human nature. And in the mystery of the union between the divine and the human natures of Christ, the divine nature has always had a saity, self-existence. But the father, when he granted the son to have life in himself, he was granting him in his human nature to have a saity. And so Jesus can say in John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge, he says, I received from my Father. Again, the divine nature of Christ has always existed, but the human nature of Christ came into existence when he was conceived in the womb. And so it is his human nature then which has a saity added to it, not making Jesus God, but making it equal in that sense with the divine nature. That is one way of answering the dilemma. But the real point that Jesus is making here in verse 26 is to emphasize the united purpose and loving partnership between the Father and the Son as we've seen earlier in the passage. His argument is to say that if they share equally of the same nature, that He is God. And because He has life in Himself as being one with the Father, therefore He is able to give life. And Jesus here uses the language of having life, that he has life. A more precise way to say it would be that Jesus is life. And that's exactly what he says in John 11, 25. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Or as you're familiar in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Think about this. Jesus does not have power. He is power. So when he touches a sick person, they're healed by virtue of touching. Jesus does not have purity. 
that he needs to maintain. He is purity. So when he touches an unclean person, they don't make him unclean. He makes them clean. In the same way, Jesus doesn't merely have life. He is life. So when he touches a dead soul, they spring to life. All that is in God is God. And so because Jesus has life, he is life. And out of his self-existence, he can cause dead souls to come to life. You know, when you think about arguments for the deity of Christ, you can go around with Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses about whether or not Jesus ever claimed to be God. But when Jesus claims to give life, to have life in himself, that is as strong and compelling an argument as there can be. Jesus is the source of life. And because his life is eternal, the life he gives, the life he gives comes immediately and lasts forever. As we come to a close, every person, again, comes into this world spiritually dead, darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, ignorant and hard-hearted. But Jesus came, came to give life, to remove the blinders from our eyes and unite us to the life of God and teach us the truth and give us a heart of flesh. So my friend, you need to ask yourself, do you have life? Or do you look at your life and only see death? And if you only see death, have you found yourself in this hour understanding, recognizing, seeing? Do you see the reality of death in your life but desire life? Then perhaps you're hearing the voice of Christ. And I would call upon you to believe on Him. Listen to His voice. And believe Him who gave His life to rescue sinners from death. Look to Him who alone took sin upon Himself and now offers forgiveness. Trust in Him who rose from the dead and conquered death and hell. And submit to Him who calls you to bow the knee and worship Him. I urge you, if you do not have life, to marvel And believe in the life-giving work of Jesus here and now in this life. Because if you do not, the day will come when you will stand before Christ and you will marvel how you did not believe and you will never have life. Oh, believer, if you have life, live it. Breathe the air of God's grace every day. Take in the fresh words of truth and let it fill your soul. Find strength in knowing that the Spirit of Christ dwells within you, empowering you to endure trials and overcome sin and live boldly for Christ. And when you feel like sin and suffering are weighing you down and making you weak, drink deeper of the well of life because you will only find life in Him. Let's pray. Our Father, as we reflect on these words, there's so much more we could say. And yet we're humbled by this reality that we who are, came into this world sinful, haters of God, wicked. You have sent Your Son to give us life. Lord, help us to live that life for the glory of Christ, to remember each day that this life is a gift from You. It's nothing that we were due. It's nothing that we've earned. It's only a gift of Your grace. Help us to live dependent on You and seeking to glorify You in all that we do. Lord, again, if there are any here who do not yet know life, who have not believed in Christ, would You give them life today? Would you open their eyes and grant them the gift of faith and repentance that they might know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.